So tonight's speaker, I'm delighted to introduce Andrew Wilson. He's the author of a book, Wild About the Wetlands, A Year in the Life of the London Wetlands Centre, which was published in 2021. He's well known for his beautiful photography. Uh, he's, he started developing a, a sort of photography, in, a de developing his interest in photography relatively recently, I think. He studied at Putney School of Art and Design, and he published his first book, Wild in the City, in 2009, and he's followed up with uh, that with many more, so there's plenty to explore there. And I just liked uh, uh, also his kind of real appreciation of local open spaces and the nature that can be found there. I think that's really wonderful. So I'm going to stop my screen sharing now. I'm going to pass you over to Andrew. Right, hopefully everybody can see that. And uh, good evening and thank you very much, Maria, for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, yes, I, I, I um, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> I know more about photography than I do about nature, so you'll have to forgive me if I um, if I don't know the Latin for various things that um, you, you may discover. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've I, I've been a member of the wetlands ever since it opened. Uh, I live literally just up the road, uh, and uh, it took me a while to convince them that um, they they should have a book. But I was uh, it, it's this is this was a very much a passion project. I, I produced about. 25 books on on the villages of, of my part of town, uh, stretching from Chelsea down to the latest one, which was on Teddington and Bushy Park. Um, but this one, it was specific to the, to the wetlands, which hadn't been done. I couldn't believe it hadn't been done. Um, uh, but they are a funny organisation. It took me a while to convince them that it was something that we do. And uh, and then I then lockdown happened. So it, was, it actually turned out to be a three year project because I was, I was it, it is actually considered a zoo because of the some of the captive birds they have there. So they had to close um, during lockdown. But yes, yeah, so I, I was pleased that it was voted Barnes Book of the Year for twenty one, um, and uh, uh, and I I just thought it would be nice to to take you through the book. Uh, I don't normally do my books seasonally, but I thought in this instance this book suited that. So. Um, Without further ado, I, don't know, I understand some people may have already been there, but this is a picture actually of of the reservoirs before um, this all these, these all these wonderful changes occurred. Um, back in sort of the late seventies, uh, Thames Water, who owned them, wanted to redevelop them, and and it and it um, and interestingly, um, and, and Giles Brandreth was telling me this story. Um, that, that he was central to uh, a, a something being uh, put together by um, for, or to Thames Water to, to stop them redeveloping and, and came up with his idea. But to cut a long story short, Giles Brandreth was a friend of Prince Philip's um, and they were having a chat one, one evening and it, it occurred that um, he mentioned about this the, the, all these, because uh, Giles lives in Barnes, um, and he was talking to Prince Philip about these reservoirs, and he said, oh, you, you need to talk to my friend Peter Scott. Um, and that's how Giles and Peter met. And from that, um, we have this wonderful wetland centre, um, uh, which the money was provided for by Barclay Homes, who took a, a part of the you can see in the in the in the top picture, they took part of the area to build a, a rather nice uh, residential area. Um, but other than that, th you know, three quarters of it was put across to to the most amazing wetlands you've um, that you've ever find anywhere in probably Europe, so close to the centre of town. Um, unusually, uh, of course, that. It, for London, as we all know, it hardly ever snows other than last month, would you believe? Um, but for this project, I had to use library pictures that I'd taken um, uh, you know, some years before because um, I think it, it's it obviously snowed in 2018, but I didn't actually go into the centre at that time. And anyway, that, that snow only lasted, I think, about probably like two days or something like that. Uh, it was very cold, I seem to remember. But um, so I, I, I but. I was just lucky that I did actually have some snow pictures that I could use, um, but the, but it is a fantastic place and it looks extraordinary with with uh, a, a lovely a new dusting of snow. Um, and 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 in the bottom picture, it was rather fun that this uh, 
coop was it maybe more hen actually um decided to um wander into the picture for me so um winter is is a particularly fine time to see one of my favorite birds uh the lapwing um they they fly around in great groups at the center um and uh, it, it is a wonderful time to be able to get it you know a nice group picture um but they're lovely birds and they make of course extraordinary noises um and uh, we do get the odd ones trying to breed but they're uh as with lots of places in london the the black-headed gulls tend to uh, take over and and sort of get in the way and also almost scare them off which is a shame um here's, a, here's another other of my favorite pictures i took um of the lap wings um of course as a photographer what you get in the in the winter is you do get some fab fabulous light um and it and, and you do get to see obviously the housing stage at the at the back but what was interesting to me was all the um cormorants taking off in the foreground um but yeah no i mean this time of year it's 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 it is fabulous there um and of course you get to see this famous bit and, and um again for the project uh, i didn't get to see it um but thankfully again i had some shots in my library that i was able to use um and i don't know whether you followed uh the london wetland center on on twitter but they somebody actually got some fabulous video a, a week or so ago um and uh so that that was fun but they are quite extraordinary birds and very very difficult to see um and and, and just to demonstrate that if you the insect picture is actually a blow up of the of actually the picture behind um and if you imagine that's what you see even with a zoom from the from one of the hides uh you know you'd be you'd struggle to see a bitten uh, <laughs> uh and you know so you know they're there a lot of the time and we usually get about half a dozen but you, you're lucky if you actually see them because they, they're so well camouflaged it's extraordinary um here's a, a fun picture um sadly the the swans are no uh, are not there at the moment i think they've taken them to slimbridge um, uh, and that may be to do with the bird flu, um, but uh, it was quite fun because some of the enclosures they have, um, and you may recognise this one, you can actually sort of, you know, I was playing around with them. I, I, I literally disappeared and then and, and encouraged them to look over and see what was going on. But I just love the look on the face. Um, so that's, that's one of my favourite pictures I took for the project. Um, they do have obviously swans, not quite in the sort of numbers that you might see at Slimbridge. Um, but uh, of course, I you know I was desperate to try and get them doing something um, that you know sort of it's probably a cliched picture now. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I still felt I needed to get one. Um, and they do have sort of three or four of the larger lakes, and they have a, a pair of swans because they are very territorial, um, and they um, push off anybody that's not allowed. But they do have three or four pairs that do nest each year. So black-headed gulls, of course, I, I was keen to uh, to photograph them. They have lots of them there. And of course, it, in, in the winter, they lose their black heads, um, which I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, barring the little bit of uh, just behind the eye. Um, but they are a squabbly lot of birds. And uh, at feeding time for the captive birds of course you can't stop the gulls from coming in and trying to nick all the food that they're trying to feed to the um the captive ones um but it does offer some a wonderful opportunity this time of year to to get them in nice light and um just a, an interesting fact um uh, talking about latin i did discover for the book that the the latin for the uh the gulls um part of the name is Ridibundus, uh, which actually translates in Latin to laughing, laughing gull. So that, I thought that was quite amusing because they do make that sort of noise if you've, um, if you've ever studied them or watched them or hear, heard them. Um, so moving on to spring, um, I, again, I hadn't noticed that they have a, a, a massive cowslip at, at, uh, at the centre, but this, but uh, in, in 
you know, I made over 200 visits over a three year period for the book. Um, and I always felt that on, uh, there was at least going to be one picture I took on every visit that I, you know, because sometimes you turn up and it's maybe it's even an awful day and you would think, well, why the devil did I bother to come? But, you know, I always felt that I would walk away with something nice. Um, and, you know, before of, I was going in like sort of every other day sort of thing, I had not no noticed that the cowslips are everywhere. Um, but what a beautiful flower. Um, and this would probably be in April. Um, an another one, the fritillary, um, snake said, um, fabulous, fabulous flower. Um, and they're around, I suppose, for about three weeks. Um, and again, fabulous in the dew with a bit of light, you know, beautiful. Um, I obviously during spring flowers, I was, you know, I would be, try and get them in the, some of the birds. So that's a, I think it's a barnacle goose on the top there and a moorhen on the bottom. I, I, I tried to get the, I was obviously, I wanted to get the flowers, but I thought well, it's a, a bird sanctuary. So let's try and get a few birds in there as well. And, and it's quite an interesting story attached to the bottom one with the moorhen. I was actually lying on the ground to get that picture. Um, and a group of um, birders came by and you could tell they were birders because they had all that sort of khaki gear with, you know, pockets filled with various things and you know, packed lunches and cameras galore and this sort of thing. Um, and they, I was, the moorhen hadn't appeared at this point and they all wondered what the devil I was doing, just lying in, lying in the grass. And so they all joined me. <laughs> so that was quite funny. Um, the, they they do actually have some sheep. They also have some cattle. I don't think I've got a picture of the cattle in this in this uh, um, talk, but um, they they have some sheep and some cattle, and that's to try and keep um, a, a natural way of keeping the grasses um, cut nicely. Um, the cattle in particular, and these these were all donated um, by some of the friends of the wetlands. I'm not actually even sure what kind of sheep they are, but um, I just thought it was. They were worth a shot for the book. Of course, spring is time for the juices are flowing and the swans hate the geese and they're forever chasing them. So um, I thought it would be fun to, to include a picture of that because they those, those swans are viciously um, uh, protective of their areas. Uh, and they do pick on the uh, Canada geese in particular. Uh, I live very near Barnes Pond and we hardly have any geese now left there at all. Um, because the, 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 uh, the male swan in particular just can't stand them. Um, and of course, you know, coots are famous for fighting and they fight in the most extraordinary fashion, um, and putting up, I mean, I, I'm amazed that they don't seriously hurt each other with the feet that big and clawing at each other. Um, but uh, yeah, so spring is, again, they're viciously ter ter territorial as well. So um, fascinating to watch them fighting. Now we come on to my, this is this got to be my my top bird um, anywhere, uh, it, it, certainly UK wise, I mean, um, they are, are beautiful, quite difficult to see at the wetlands, uh, and, and obviously quite difficult to, to get to, um, to actually display for you, um, certainly in a place where you can actually photograph them. Um, but I was allowed in at various times before the public, so I, I got some unfettered uh, mornings when the light was good but they do this I don't know whether people have watched it but they do this fabulous sort of necking business and, and this but I was fascinated to discover that actually they are single-handedly responsible uh, and peacocks for the foundation of the Society for the Protection of Birds because in 1889 a, a lady by the name of Emily Williamson um, wanted to fight the fashion of people using exotic bird feathers uh, in ladies' hats. So that was her motivation. And of course, the grebe um, uh, was one of those that had uh, feathers which people wanted to have on the hat. So um, it's quite interesting to, to note that you know, the RSPB came about because a, a very far-sighted woman said, this is crazy, we shouldn't be doing this. So even back in the 1880s, it, it, you know, there were people like us out there fighting for, for nature. So here, here's a few more shots of the displays that you can see. They're just absolutely extraordinary. And, and this bird, the female, I think is the one, it's very hard to tell, um, is the one uh, sort of crouching down. But she disappeared under the water and suddenly appeared directly in front of him and he got all very excited. 
as you can see but it's just a wonderful thing to watch and and that's occurs from sort of march april may time that uh, uh, so if you're if you want to go and watch that sort of thing it's it's fantastic to watch um of course they're great um uh, fishermen um and here i, I rather like the way he, he's sort of got a bit of salad with his fish um a, a leaf uh, i didn't actually see how he got rid of the leaf um so uh, well, i can't remember how he did it but it was, i thought it was quite a nice shot um now this is not a particularly fine shot um but i i felt i had to include it it was, it, it was a long way away but part of their mating display is where they they pass each other weed um and again it's an extraordinary thing to watch but you know that's the best i could do um uh, but you know you can at least i wanted to show you what 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 actually goes on and of course the the, the head bobbing on the on the picture on the right with the fantastic crests on the head i mean they're just oh i love it i love it um so spring uh, early spring um obviously amphibians that there's probably more marsh frogs you'll see it at the at the wetland center than you do the, the common garden one but uh, i was desperate to try and get a picture where i had you know part of the under you know so i had to find a you know they, they have one or two in the kids section they have one or two pools where you can sort of lean over and you can and and, and see the water and get quite close because i wanted to see them so that you saw them above the water and below um, so that was why I did that. But the, the, the marsh frog is probably the ones that you'll see more of. You'll certainly hear them more because they make this extraordinary noise. Um, I, I mean, and they're not native to the UK, um, but uh, and I'm not really sure you guys probably know more about this than I do about where they actually came from. But there's some thought that they um, maybe the Hounslow area. I don't know Hounslow Heath, but you know, I don't sure quite how they how they arrived. But they certainly seem to be in a lot of places. Um, and you know, there's another reservoir nature reserve in barns called the leg of mutton um, and they have a lot of them there yes the um of course nesting in the spring uh, I, the, the moor hens seem to do the, the weirdest things and also they seem to do it in if you look at the bottom picture it's quite um there's three of them because as i've said that the females on the nest and then it must i can only assume it's a juvenile from a previous brood maybe even from the previous year who's still part of the family and is helping with helping with the nest but why on earth they feel they need any more material for this nest because you can see they've completely filled this box um but it was a successful nest it didn't topple over um and during the course of doing the book um somebody created a lot of a load of artworks which were deposited around some of the lakes um, and, and and ponds, and I, and I, I imagine this is I hope this is what the artist had in mind that what that they would be taken over by the local bird population to be used. And I was so I was pleased to find this moorhen decided that oh actually I'll, I'll I'll just build my nest here. So so that was quite fun. Um, so obviously lots of young. Uh, this is a young mallard um so there's obviously lots of young around in, in the spring and again if i was being able to get in early i was able to to see them undisturbed um, and this was one of my more favorite pictures that i took of, of the young but uh, this was another one where they they are almost born to um chase things um so this you know this is a very young mallard and and it's chasing this uh I'm not quite sure what it is, a midge or something. You can just see it in, 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 in the picture. Um, it may be a mayfly. Um, but yeah, he was um, uh, going at some speed. So I had to play around with my the functionality of my camera to make sure I got a decent shot. Um, and he did actually um, capture the thing, so uh, the, the, the insect. So that was, that was quite fun. Um, and of course, as, as you're going around with your camera bag, this, uh, this was actually not my camera bag, it was a friend of mine's camera bag, but um, I noticed this Robin was joining us for what we were doing. And I said, well, if we back away for a bit, you never know, he might land on our kit. <laughs> and sure enough, he did. <laughs> so I thought it'd be fun to include that. Um, now this was, uh, the only reason I've included this, apart from the fact that I think that they're quite nice photographs, this was actually the, the first day uh, after um, I think this may have been the second, it has been the second, first, well, maybe this was the first lockdown, maybe no, second lockdown, I think. So this would have been April the 12th, uh, 2021. 
Um, and uh, so as I, it was a beautiful day, quite cold, um, uh, but as I, I love clouds, so I like the top picture and I like the, I waited for those three people to, to come into shot. And, and the bottom picture, um, it was actually just taken on my phone. Um, it was just as I was walking around, um, they just in the path in my way. And I suppose they felt I was going to feed them, which you're not in, you're not let's say, encouraged to do, allowed to do really. Um, but uh, it, was, it was quite fun meeting them on the path. Uh, they have a couple of, uh, of short clawed uh, otters, um, Asian they are, and these ones are called Todd and Honey. I couldn't tell you which is Todd and which is Honey, um, but they are very popular. Um, um, and I was pleased to get their picture when they were uh, just sunbathing and having a little bit of a zoo, a sniz. Uh, if you like your insects, of course, it's, it's again fabulous to be able to get things like this blue, common blue damselfly. Um, and, and so if you like your macro photography, a great place to do it. You can just sit yourself down on one of the paths and in amongst the grasses next to you. If you're next to a pool, there's going to be loads of these beautiful insects just ready and waiting to, to, to be photographed. Um, something about the reeds. Um, I think I'm right in saying in order to build the centre, I think they hand planted 100,000 reeds, which must have been some undertaking. Um, uh, but they do need to, um, to, to, to doctor them every two or three years. So they'll, they'll move around the centre and they'll cut them right back. But they do rapidly grow back. So you can see here, um, this is where the new growth has come through and where they've cut it. But of course, um, the reeds are a, a popular haunt for reed warblers. Um, and uh, what a fabulous song. You may not see them necessarily, but you, um, so it takes a lot of patience to be able to photograph them. And then sometimes, you know, with a bit of wind, you're gonna get a reed come in front of you um, so um, they are difficult, but they do have a beautiful song. Um, one of the things I, I, I noted on when I was doing the book is I hadn't actually got any uh, birds of prey. Um, and this was probably, I was getting into the summer of 21 and I hadn't got a birds of prey yet. And because um, they do have a pair of peregrine falcons that visit quite a lot who nest on Charing Cross Hospital, which I'm sure you'll, uh, a lot of you will know. Um, and the, the kestrels fly over it, but I, I hadn't actually got any decent photography. And then, you know, literally, I was just sort of thinking about it. And boy, I, I came across a pair nesting over one of the pools. Um, and I got some rather fantastic pictures of them. Uh, sadly, that looks like a baby chick of some description, but it, it makes for a good picture, even if it is a bit gory. Um, so here we are probably moving into summer now, um, or early summer anyway, the, the black-headed girls, they are hugely successful and they take over the little islands. Um, and uh, as you'll see in the bottom picture, their young are beautifully uh, coloured and perfect for the cam camouflaged. Um, so that, because uh, they do have a lot of herons, of course, um, uh, who'd only love to pick off those if they could. Um, and in fact, uh, so here you can see the markings much better. If you look at the stones and then you think of them just lying on those stones, um, you can see how perfect they are, uh, camouflage they are. Well, they have a lot of these rafts where, the, where they nest. Um, and I noticed that during the project for the book, this raft in particular, I mean, you, you can count them. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I can see at least 10 young in there, maybe more. Uh, and they've put they put the wire up there to protect them falling off because they don't want to drown. But of course, what they haven't done, and I think they've now changed that, they, they didn't provide any cover. So sadly, about two days after I'd taken this picture, a heron came in and, and basically went off with a lot uh, throughout one day. It was quite sad to, 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 to hear of and witness. Um, and here is that. Uh, I don't know whether this was the actual one, but it was uh, uh, certainly one of them. Now, this is not a picture taken at the Wetland Centre, but this shows you what we've done. Uh, I'm a friend of Barnes Common, or Barnes Common as it's now known. 
uh, and the leg of mutton, which I mentioned earlier, we have some open rafts there, but we, we supply these little um, upturned tiles, um, which the young can disappear under and avoid being picked off by the herons, because there's actually a heronry at, uh, um, at the leg of mutton. So um, yeah, I was uh, one of my favorite pictures here, Greeb just caught a fish and black headed girl coming in trying to nab it. So I, I think that actually the Greeb got away into the reeds before the gull could get to it. But again, quite a nice action shot. Again, just taken from the hides. I, I always find that if you turn up at a hide and there's nothing necessarily on view at that moment, if you hang around for half an hour, it's amazing what you will then discover if you have the patience just to sit there. And, and one of those moments was, you know, again, I didn't have a fox. And then suddenly one evening I was able to get this fox um, and he's looking for this lapwing's nest. And you can just see the lapwings being disturbed and uh, trying to uh, fly at him to try and stop him finding the nest or certainly try and distract him from where their nest, which is presumably in amongst those uh, irises and um, uh, oxide daisies. And of course, then uh, having seen this fox, I then saw him several times over the next two or three days. So, you know, they don't seem to worry about water. And even though they have electric fences and things uh, to try and keep the foxes out, well, that doesn't seem to <laughs> doesn't seem to work in the case of this guy. Um, and he, he was he was everywhere. And, you know, he would just stride through uh, the, the wetlands and, and he deserved this uh, a massive flock of starlings down in the in the bottom right hand corner. So that was quite fun. Um, Coots, very successful, uh, and I sort of included this picture just to prove how successful they are, but this was probably taken um, you know, after the mating season when they, they tend to, and this may be actually just a group of, of, of a massive group of juveniles, but they do have a lot of them there. Uh, oyster catchers, they do have the odd pair, um, and during the course of, of last year, 2021 that would be, that this pair did actually uh, have a nest uh, and were successful and had two young, but sadly within three hours, in other words, before I could actually get there to record it, um, they were predated. So that was very sad. And this is after the event. So um, I, I don't know whether they were they're clearly in mourning. I don't know. I don't know how it affects birds. But um, yeah, that was sad. I was hoping to to, to get a nice picture of some young oyster catchers. Um, here's just to prove that uh, the swans are, are, can be successful, but it's, I, I love clouds, reflections. Uh, basically uh, that picture has everything. Uh, they do have some little uh, egrets um, that are uh, at the center, two or three all year round now because of the warm weather, because they're not normally, they normally um, would probably not be here all the year round, but they are now. And that's, I suppose, again, another sign of, of global warming. Um, sadly, I didn't get, I, I did follow a couple of uh, great crested grebe nests, but the ones I was following weren't successful. But uh, I hadn't noted a, a, a little grebe's nest, but they clearly were successful. And it was, it was fun to see that they do go around on the backs of the um of the parents and here he's just being fed a little minnow um but uh, yeah so that was fun to get and again literally just happened right below the hide that i was in uh july august are known for their wonderful flowers so fleabane at the top um and the pyramid orchids they're everywhere uh again the wonderful thing to photograph um i'm very fond of butterflies um, so I think that's probably, I thought it was a meadow brown, but it may be a gatekeeper, not sure, but I think it's a meadow brown. Some of you people know your butterflies better than I do, will probably say, but um, so I, 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 I'm pleased to get a nice picture of fleabane in nice light, but it was just fortunate that this butterfly happened to pop in at the same time. Uh, bee orchid, again, we have some areas where these could be found. Um, and last year, actually, that was the best I'd ever seen it. Uh, and in fact, there was one patch very near the main building. But, you know, there were people walking past them who would, wouldn't even notice that they were there. But what a beautiful flower that is. 
Common Blue. Now this was fun. It took me about three quarters of an hour to get this uh, brimstone butterfly. Um, but I, I rather liked from a photographic point of view, the, the combination of the green and the purple. So I was, uh, and of course nature doesn't necessarily do what you ask or want at a given time. So it took me about three quarters of an hour to get the, the butterfly in the right position, in the right light with the right um, background. So that was great fun. Um, but I thought that came out rather well. Uh, here's another of my absolute faves in terms of butterflies, marble whites. We do have some marble whites, usually around from the end of June. Um, and pleased to find a, a couple on, on the same plant. Um, but I have been to Box Hill in the past. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I think I was able to get over 10 in one picture. But I also got um, a lot of uh, uh, ticks. So one needs to be very careful when you're um, kneeling down in grass, certainly in the summer. But yeah, so we have uh, marble whites, which are a, a most beautiful, beautiful butterfly. Um, another thing I was desperate to get for the book was obviously a kingfisher. Again, very shy birds. Uh, they do have several nesting there, but of course they, they, they won't, they, they put up one or two sand walls and in the hope of encouraging them to, uh, to nest. But of course, no, they don't want to use those. They want to go off and hide somewhere in the, uh, uh, somewhere else on on the uh, on the site which where people can't really see them but um during the autumn of 2020 my my wife decided to come with me which is quite a rare thing and it was that day that i discovered we discovered just outside one of the hides the picture on the left uh, and he was literally just fishing in front of us so what a joy that was so i sort of chalked that one up to my wife having come with me and i said well you're obviously going to have to come with me more often so you can encourage that sort of action. So this is, I think I'm right at making, so this is Southern Hawker uh, Dragonfly, again, all over the place during the summer, um, but the devil to photograph uh, in flight. Um, and I'm sure some of you have, have, have uh, discovered that for yourself. But hey, I wanted to do it. So, you know, you have to, you have to be patient. I was rather pleased with this photograph because um, I like the, uh, the 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 boker in the background, um, and uh, but again it, it it was fortunate to be allowed in early so that um, there was less disturbance. Um, on some of the again, this is something that the common lizards that people don't uh, don't even notice. But as you're walking around, you can find these sunning themselves on some of the wooden railings that you have around around the center and and, and they, they like nothing better than to to sunbathe and actually they'll let you get up quite close um and, and use your your macro uh, lenses to to photograph them but yeah he was giving me the eye but he was quite happy just to to let me i mean this was one of several shots that i took he was quite happy just to 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 let me get on with it bit of a show off really uh, i've included this because um purely because I, I felt that they were all nicely socially distanced. <laughs> it probably needed, I think there was one, I think on the left, but it had flown off. But given this was a lockdown project, I thought I should include that. And it was, uh, I, I like to do sort of extended captions with some of my photographs. So I think that went into the book as a, a lockdown, <laughs> lockdown image. Um, autumn's probably sometimes the best time to, to, get, a, to get a sunset because uh, at the end of October, they, they allow people in, I think, till five o'clock up until the end of October. But the clocks go back probably, you know, sometimes if, this year, of course, or last year, rather, it was the last day was October the 31st, which was a Sunday. But sometimes you get a week of nights when you can actually be on site at the end of the day. And this was a shot taken from the Peacock Tower. But it was a it was a spectacular night. Autumn is a nice again nice time at the center. They don't have that many trees. You know, the, the, the maple is not something that you see a lot of because um, it's not native. So there's not many of them there. So you don't get any amazing color, but the, there is some color there, and um, it, it is a nice time to to, to visit. 
this was us. This was quite fun. Um, I was like a bit of reflection again, just taken on my phone. Um, and this couple just, you know, wandered by. Uh, of course, uh, autumn is a good time for, for fungi. Um, again, you've got to be uh, sharp eyed and uh, get uh, into odd places to discover. And they like wood, essentially. Um, and uh, so if you can find small rotting wood, um, that's, you know, uh, and they do have lots of piles of wood lying around. And if you're lucky, you get to see something as beautiful as that. Um, here's walking away from one of the hides, uh, setting sun, reeds, sort of very much an autumn shot. Um, now in 2020, they started, because um, the, the manager used to be the manager at Kew. Um, so she's brought the idea of putting on a light show to try and encourage people to come in who wouldn't not necessarily come to a, um, a wetland centre. Um, now, obviously, they can't do it quite on the scale of Q, so you don't have loud music and you don't have fireworks and you don't have lasers and this sort of thing, because it's a it's a bird sanctuary, so uh, they don't want to put them off. But I, I commend them for doing it. I think it's a clever idea and it's actually, you know, the kids love it. Um, and so they, they did it again last year. They did, it wasn't open every day like the previous one. Um, but no, it, it, it's a fun thing and I'm sure they'll keep keep doing it. So that's um, that's my sort of quick trawl through my book. The book is over 200 pages long, um, but it forms part of a series of books I've done, um, all with the title Wild About. As, as Maria said at the very beginning, I started with something called Wild in the City, and I then did a book on the Thames, and I was wondering what to call it. And my family said, well, you've, you called it Wild About, so why didn't you continue? So I... I now I'm wild about everything, um, and and this is just a, a a small selection of of books that I've the ones along the bottom are, are some of my most recent. I've even done a kids book, um, but yeah. So I, I I'm got as far north as Notting Hill. I've done Chelsea, um, and as I said, my latest one was Teddington, Teddington and Bushy Park. Um, but uh, if there's uh, if you want to follow me on social media both Instagram and Twitter. I'm Wild London Picks. Um, and I've also got, um, uh, as I said, uh, this is my sort of Barnes collection, some cards, but I've, I, I've for this evening, I've put together a little offer, which I, I, I believe they're gonna put up on your, on your website. And I think they'll put it out generally in a newsletter or something, but I just thought, um, it is a lovely book and I've had a lot of anecdotal evidence to say it's one of my best. So I just throw this offer out to members of your society, 25% um, uh, off. But if you use the code, your, your own code, it's at the bottom of LNHS25 at the checkout, um, I will recognize that as being not only will you get a 25% off, but you can also, um, I'll also send you one of my calendars um, as I've done, I do half a dozen of those um okay they don't cover the whole of london but they cover my area of london but i've also done a, a, an exclusive range of 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 little greeting card notelets um with envelopes which i, I will also throw in so anybody wants to buy the book get the book um and you'll also be helping wwt in, in the process because um 10 percent of the cover price which i'll obviously cover as part of my thing um that goes to wwt to help with their work. Um, since we've got a bit of time, um, if, if it's okay with Maria, I thought I might just quickly show you something else of mine. Is that, would that, are you okay with that? Do you want to just nod? Yeah, that, that's okay. We've got a few you know, minutes. I, yeah, I just wondered whether you might, might like to see my favorite pictures that I took in, um, um, in, in 2022. I only include this picture. This is actually strand on the green taken from Kew Bridge, but it was taken on January the 1st, 2021. Um, I'd been to a party, uh, was up quite late. It got to about four o'clock. So I thought there's little point in going to bed. So I, I lay down on the settee uh, for three hours and then got up so I'd see the dawning and I was 
very pleased that I did um because I not only got to see that last shot I got to see this pair of Egyptian geese um reflected in in it was a low tide so everything worked perfectly um I took myself off to Slimbridge because I'd done the book I thought it'd be quite nice to, to go and visit some of the centers and uh uh, of course, in January, um, the light is, you know, is getting going down at sort of between three and four. So the centre is still open because they do feed the birds there a lot. But I was quite pleased with that shot. And in fact, they've taken that as a um, uh, as one of the cards they sell in the centres. Um, this was in Bushy Park, part of my Bushy Park project. This was a stone chat. Uh, they have some fabulous frosts in, in Bushy Park, but I, I, I particularly like... I, he landed on, they do like stone chats. They love landing on things that, you know, so it's perfect for photography. And he just knocked off one or two of the, the hoarfrost and you can just see them just falling away. So I was pleased to have captured that. This is what I term my um, uh, two-headed deer. Um, <laughs> this was actually in Richmond Park, but um, it, it, it just looks like he's got two heads. Um, but yeah, uh, it's a strange thing lifting its head like that but yeah fabulous morning that was um we have about 40 swans on the river in barns currently um and they're still there they're fed every day by someone who um it's very it's a, it's a swan sanctuary lady that comes every day to feed them um and there used to be a lot more in uh in richmond and putney but they seem to have stopped going there and have ended up coming to um coming to barns so I was desperate to try and get a picture, a nice picture of them with a nice sunset at low tide, which I eventually did, I think, on January the 31st. Um, this is a fascinating story connected with this is with actually the in Putney. This was the uh, head of the river race, 400 queues, uh, crews get in the river in Putney. So it's mayhem for about an hour and a half. And when all the boats had got in, I suddenly noticed this family of Egyptian geese had been there the whole time as all these people were steaming into the river. It was extraordinary that they <laughs> that they uh, they survived. Um, anyway, so I thought I'd better get a record of that. Um, this was Storm, uh, who can remember Storm Eunice? Eunice, I think it was. Um, uh, this was fantastic. If you go to New Haven, this is what you can see. Um, uh, and uh, so, I, and, and unusually there was sunlight, uh, in the afternoon so i was desperate to try and get um the, the light in the right place uh, and i was particularly pleased with the way that i just captured the top of the lighthouse um so yeah that was a, that was a fantastic picture and, and i just love storms um, um you could hardly stand up mine there was about half a dozen people lying on the beach photographers taking pictures of waves and and stuff um this is the hercules statue at uh, kew gardens but i was uh, it was just particularly nice light um, and I like the way that I got them silhouetted with the fountains they have there. Um, I was doing a lot of uh, petal work, uh, blossom in puddles and that sort of thing and, and as I was lying getting a very muddy taking a, 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 a macro shot of a, a floating bit of petal this slug appeared from inside the petal and decided to um, I mean, it looks big here because it's a macro shot, but that's actually tiny as a baby. Um, but yeah, so that was quite fun. Uh, obviously, uh, Magnolia, this is at my local club. Um, so I, I, I love taking flowers. Magnolia is fantastic. I've got a friend called Tammy Marler, who's a wonderful garden photographer. She does some fantastic pictures of uh, Magnolia. Um, this was a special picture I took in April in Bushy Park when just one of those fabulous mornings when mist, light, uh, everything just come together. This was that same morning. I love this tree and it was just fortunate that this whole group of deer decided to, to, to walk underneath it. Uh, the local Savills office in, in Teddington now have that as a, a whole wall print. Which is, um, which is very kind of them to buy that off me. Um, this is actually a fabulous morning in Richmond Park. Um, uh, those that live near there, again, you know, misty morning um, and uh, just catching the sun at the right time. Uh, I, I like my macro work and 
just something as, as simple as um, uh, this particular flower whose name's just suddenly gone out of my head, um, but it's a garden weed effectively, but it's it comes out um, very early. So it, it's wonderful for bees. Um, but yeah, so I was very pleased with that, that shot. Here were some uh, grebes that I shot last year in, in Richmond Park. Again, displaying well for me. Okay, here again, lovely bee, lovely, fantastic bokeh behind the water, iris, all coming together beautifully. Um, we have about 30, over 30 grasses on Barnes Common, and I've done a project to photograph them all, or as many as I can. I think I've got up to about 23. Um, but it's always fun when you're doing that, and then a common blue it comes in and roosts on, on one you're trying to take a picture of. Uh, this was a marble white on Barnes Common on the Oxeye Daisy, but again, macro, you've got to be patient. This was a, a rabbit in Bushy Park, but I love the way he was just sort of sniffing the, sniffing the grass. Uh, for the Bushy Park book, I, I met a, a fox rescuer and he was looking after this or keeping an eye out for this orphan uh, fox. And uh, so he went into the Woodland Gardens there and, uh, in June and uh, he said, we, we, we sit down, you never know, he might come out. And sure enough, he came and sat down next to us. What a beautiful thing he was. Um, this is what an amazing summer we had. And it just shows that with the, um, the contrast between the, just the very parched land and, and this particular wonderful tree. Uh, again, showing off how parched everything was with a stag. This is Clapham Common. I mean, look at that. There's absolutely no grass there at all. This looks like the savannah. This is actually Tooting Common. Uh, this was rather a nice cloud formation over Barnes Terrace. Uh, I don't know whether anybody got to go to the Tower of London for the wildflower show, but wow, was that spectacular. And I was very pleased this lady just came into shot for me, which it sort of balanced the shot rather nicely. Um, this was, I went, I'm a big croquet player and I went to play in a competition with my wife on the Isle of Wight and we stayed with a friend overnight, but this was a spectacular sunset. Um, saw my first clouded yellow butterfly uh, on Barnes Common uh, last August, so I was pleased to, they were only around for about three hours, two of them, so I, I was just, I felt pleased enough to get a, a decent shot of one of them. Uh, sadly, the Queen died, as we all know, and uh, I, I wondered how I'd record it. I didn't stand in, in line or go to the, see the coffin, but I, uh, I did photograph the minute guns in Hyde Park um, uh, with their, uh, which they performed three or four times during that week. This was a spectacular sunrise in Richmond Park. I, I have a dog, it features in all my books. Um, and uh, she's now, it's a spring of Spanish, she's now 16 and a half, would you believe, still alive. Um, this was a picture taken near Teddington Lock. Um, this was a, uh, some fungi at my local club. This one's beautiful, I thought, the lovely colours, all lovely sort of autumn colours. I, I called this the crown, I thought it sort of um, suited it. This is Putney Bridge, rather lovely clouds. Uh, Having had the most amazing summer, then we then had the most amazing autumn that went on to the middle of December until we had that amazing frost. Um, this was uh, Chiswick House. This was uh, Bushy Park. And this was the Woodland Gardens. And that this was the day, if you remember, when we had that amazing frost and it, that cold snap started before the snow came. And this ginkgo lost all its leaves overnight. And, and it just made this amazing display at the bottom of it. Um, that was a robin I caught a few days later on Barnes Common. That's a very famous tree on Barnes Common, the Grand Old Oak. And that's a shot just before Christmas of the Albert Hall, like you've probably never seen it before. And that's, uh, and the, that's the last shot, right, two gardens. <laughs> thank you very much. I, and thank you so much for sharing all those photographs with us. I mean, people were saying just how, um, you know, kind of beautifully photographed and you really capture 
the kind of the mood and the light, the you know, the lighting in those is, is really beautiful. Um, I, I we haven't got very much time left. I did want to just ask you what kind of equipment you're using to because I know people who are kind of interested in photography quite like to know um what sort of things you're using. Do you use a range of things or have you got sort of something that you mainly stick to using? Well, I, I I'm a Canon user um and I use a Canon uh, 6D with a variety of lenses so i have a, a, a sort of my standard lens would be the 24 to 105 uh sort of stock one don't but then i have a macro i also have a, a one to 100 to 400 zoom lens that they're, they're, they're fantastic the prime lens is brilliant um and but i i do i do take pictures with my phone um mm. i will always have my phone in my pocket i don't necessarily always have my camera with me so sometimes and also you can actually get a phone in places where you can't necessarily get your your big camera um mm. so it sometimes actually is perfect and of course the cameras in phones these days are amazing they're not great at the at the ends of the ranges so the highlights and the shadows they're not very good at capturing those um but other than that they're pretty good you know and i mean and also they don't give you a huge file that you can necessarily print from but there are there are various softwares you can use to enhance pictures in that way if you do want to actually do something. I mean, the people, uh, I mean, I've seen, you know, uh, shots used on, on advertising hoardings, which have been taken on a phone, particularly like the panoramas you can do, which are fantastic. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, somebody did pop in the chat whether you, you've got any pictures or seen any water voles or bats at the London Well, that, well that, the, the bats, of course, <laughs> dusk they're hard enough to photograph <laughs> at the best of times so they, they do do bat walks actually so they're much more likely to see them than to actually photograph them and i didn't want to go and disturb them because they mm. do have like a bat house there um now water voles fascinating i did i did go i did get a snake i did get a grass snake but of course water voles um they do have them there but they are predated quite a lot by they do they sadly have mink there um, but they also by the the local heron why that why do every time i see one with and i think why can't they take the rats to this we've got loads <laughs> of those why do they have to take the water vole you know mm -hmm. um so i never got one for I've, i think i don't think i've ever seen a water vole for the, uh, you know i did a day in a life for the book i did a one of the features in the book is a day in a life of a birder and i met i met a guy through there and i spent the day with him and i took some pictures and he gave me some of the pictures see he's got a short-eared owl photograph he took at this wetland center sometimes it's just luck isn't it you'll just stay at the right time yeah so by anyway the way, th these owls by the way if everyone's thinking they were shot on barnes common in 2021 during yeah, lockdown yeah we were admiring as as you kind of like arrived and Chris and i were admiring that it's a lo really lovely shot and thank you so much for you know sharing all your kind of um, knowledge and interest in the London Wetlands Centre. It's obviously you know I think sort of seeing it, watching it over a, a year and seeing the changes through the seasons, just really that's kind of just a really fascinating way to spend a year really. And you've captured so much of the kind of essence of it in in those photographs. Thanks again for the the kind of offer that you've done as well. You know, so if people are kind of interested in that, then you know, please do follow that up. And it's nice that some of the you know kind of the money is going to support the the centre, which is you know well worth you know very worthy cause. Um, as there's been kind of a couple of comments in the chat, which I will pick up now, which is the fact that the um, the London you know the the London Wetland Centre is a really fantastic site. So anybody who's in London or in, around London who's not been, you're kind of really missing out on an amazing site for birders and for kind of everybody who's interested in the actual world. So please do visit. They're doing a half price offer next Monday um, as it's apparently the kind of gloomiest day of the year or something. <laughs> <laughs> so well, hopefully it won't be. <laughs> no, so to cheer people up, they're doing a, a kind of half price offer. So thanks, Linda, for pointing that out. And also just to say that the uh, London Natural History Society through the London Bird Club section do visit um, the London Wetlands Centre. We you go about four type about four top four visits a year over different seasons. So please do have you know, have a look in the program. I can't couldn't see one coming up um, in the next month or so, but so we'll probably start again maybe March April. But they they well worth coming along to. So please do kind of um, you know come and join us or go kind of like independently. But definitely do visit. It's and it's it's one of those places that's worth visiting 
on many different occasions because you'll see some different things every time. So thanks for people popping those things into the chat. Um, we're going to wrap 